So to remind you what we're looking at, uh, we have code here. We have an input file there. This is just something that's running my IPython notebook that is probably not even going to be used today. But uh, just in case, I won't, I don't want to kill it. So anyway, um, so most of the time we'll be writing code over here. We will look possibly look over there at our at our inputs. So where we ended up last time was really the, the hardest part of the code, or the meat of the code, and that's this assemble matrices step, right? So to assemble the TB and Q matrices, right? We already wrote a function to compute interblock transmissibilities, commute accumulation and such. So now we actually want to put those into our T matrix, okay? And that T matrix is really the hardest one. Uh, we talked about a little bit about data structures, so I, I said I'm going to write this with, you know, and this is because I happen to know a little bit about the code that I can sort of prematurely optimize and use this LIL matrix or linked list matrix. So even though I'm sort of telling it in the end it's going to have size n by n, it, 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 it doesn't allocate and store all those zeros, okay? It's going to build up my matrix on the fly as I put entries into it with sort of the minim minimal memory footprint, okay? And so uh, we are going to remember when you when you f loop over the rows of the T matrix, you're, you're, you're basically you're, it's, you know for the for a one D problem you have a tridiagonal matrix, right? And for the most part it's pretty easy, like with three T's along the diagonal minus one T on the off diagonals. But when you have boundary conditions, you have to do something special, right? And in one D your boundary conditions are only on the left and the right, right? So the first row and the last row are really the only things you have to do something special. We want to write our code general enough that, you know, remember I told you, you know, you're not always going to have uh, constant pressure, no flow on the left and the right, right. You need to write it general enough that you could have constant pressure or no flow on the left, constant pressure or no flow on the right. So we have to put some logic in there to take care of that. Right? So, uh, so first thing we're going to do is just read in what the boundary conditions are. Right? So over here, I have, you know, this is my input file, and that's where I said boundary conditions left type. Uh, left and right and the type, okay? And then the value. So a Neumann boundary condition of zero is a no flow boundary condition. Right? A Dirichlet boundary condition of 500 is a constant pressure boundary condition at 500 PSI. Okay? But I need to read those in. So uh, I'm just going to create a new variable I'll, I'll call BCs. And that's going to come from, you remember, I have this sort of catch all input data thing where my boundary conditions are. So this BCs now is going to contain everything. It's going to contain all of that. Left type value, right type value. And then, so then I'm going to say, create a new variable, BC type 1 uh, is equal to uh, BCs left type, and then lower. So what that is, is it's, it's going to read in the value of left type. So specifically, BC type 1 for this input deck is going to be Neumann. Okay? So BC1 is going to be set to a value Neumann from that input deck. Okay? Now this lower function just makes whatever I have over there lowercase, because I'll, later I'm going to do a comparison. And I don't want, so I don't want I'm, gonna, I'm protecting myself, my future dumb self, and my users, who if someone else wants to use my code, from the fact that Neumann, you know, maybe you want to capitalize in. Right? Maybe you want to capitalize all of it. I don't want my code to fail because of, you know, you make a capitalization mistake. I don't want you to, I don't want my input deck to be that specific. This is no, you have to have everything lowercase. Right? So it's simple. One, one function built in, lower is going to lowercase everything. So that now BC, no matter what I type over there, BC type 1 is going to be the lower cased version of it. Okay. So then I have a BC type 2, which is the right, right, same thing. Okay. Two, BC type 2 is the right version. Okay. So then, so those are the types. Uh, then I'm going to have 
the values. So BC value one is going to be equal to BC's left value. And BC value two is going to be equal to right. OK? So then again, specifically, BC value one is going to be zero. And BC value two is going to be 500 for this information. Yeah. Well, if you remember last time, I talked about using this YAML parser thing, right? This is, this is, were you here last time? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is YAML, right? And we talked about that. And the Python has a library called PyYAML, which knows how to read in that data and store it properly so that I can access it like this. Mm, no, I, I mean, technically, it's, it's a data structure in Python called a dictionary. But it doesn't matter, really. What, you don't even really have to know that, right? It just, PyYAML, which is a free library I can access from Python, knows how to read in my input deck and convert it to something I can access like this, right? Which is really nice, because that's a sort of English over there. It's like structured English. And I can access it with English. I don't need cryptic things, right? So that's just reading in the boundary conditions so that I can do something with them. So I'm going to say 4i in range of n. So n is, remember, we defined it up there. It's the number of grids, right? So n is the size of my matrix. It's the rows, right? So i is going to be the rows of my matrix. Right? So from right, i into the range of n, uh, and I'm going to basically put some logic here that says uh, apply the left boundary condition. And of course, I want my code to be general enough that, you know, uh, I could apply either a Dirichlet or a von Neumann. So I'm going to say if i equals to zero, and that's because you know I'm using the, I'm just assuming that I label my grids from zero, one, right, and then this is going to be n minus one. And the reason it's in, so it's a little bit different than what you're used to, right? MATLAB would say one, two, three, right? In Python, the, the, the first entry is zero. So I have zero, one, two, and then therefore my last one is n minus one. Okay. So when I say for i in a range of n, this function range of n is going to produce a, a series of indices that i will take that go from zero to n minus one. So, uh, so if, if i equal to zero, first thing I'm going to do is compute interblock transmissibility between i and i plus one. Okay, and then. I'm going to say if BC type 1 is equal to Neumann, and this is why it's important that it's lowercase, because I, I'm going to compare to something that's all lower, lowercase, and they have to be, these are string comparisons, they have to be identical. Okay. BC type 1 equals Neumann, then the diagonal entry is equal to the diagonal entry minus T I I plus I I. Okay. So this is a little bit weird because this is saying assign the diagonal entry to something minus something. And we haven't assigned this anything yet, except we did assign it to zero, sort of. Right? So this is really. I could have just as easily just said minus t i i plus one. It's just if you write it this way, it rather these series of if statements that you're going to see here, you could actually put them in any order and it would still work. Okay.
And by the way, this is because if you remember, for the Neumann boundary condition, what you want, like if it's a homogeneous reservoir, you would normally have a 3T on the diagonal, right? But on the, for a Neumann boundary condition, you get then a 2T. Right. So that, you know, so if you have 3T normally, and then you have, then you have this minus a T, then you have 2T. So then else if BC type 1 equals Dirichlet, then I'm going to first compute T0, which remember T0 is just, it's just T. It's, it's the inner block transmissibility of the I, I, right? So remember, if you compute the interblock transmissibility of a block with itself, then you just get back T. Right? Because the block has, the I block and the I block have the same properties. And when you do the averaging, then you just get back the homogeneous T. Right? So this is a, a tr tricky way to do that, I guess. So then T I I equals T I I. Minus T I I plus one plus two times T zero. So again, this just comes from the equations, if you remember, of how we treat the Dirichlet boundary condition. So remember, you have to modify on the, for the Dirichlet boundary condition. You modify the diagonal entry of the matrix, but then you also have to modify the Q vector. You get that two in the notation of the notes. It's like two T P B, right? 2 times t times the pressure on the boundary. That ends up in the q vector. And so we'll just go ahead and do that right here. So we'll say qi is equal to 2 times t0 times bc value 1. OK. So that is on the that's on the uh, the boundary condition on the left. So I need to also do that on the right. right? So I'm going to say else if uh, i is equal to m minus one. So that would be this this grid block on the right side, then I'm basically going to do the same thing. So therefore, I'm just going to copy all of this and paste it there. It's just now the pluses are going to be minuses. And the boundary condition types will be 2 like that. And then else, right, so I'm saying, okay, so I'm saying, maybe I'll put a comma in here. Uh, apply right B, BC. So, if the row, so for row i to 1 to n, if i is equal to 0, it's on the left, apply the boundary condition in some way. If i is equal to n minus 1, it's on the right, apply that boundary condition in y. Else, it's in the middle, and just populate it doing what you'd normally do. Right? So then, um, in that case, then we just have t i i plus 1 is equal to minus that should be a I 
Everybody see how fast I move my cursor around? Are you even paying attention to that? Like, did you notice what I did? So like, I was, my cursor was there, and I want to change the minus to a plus. So I just say, because I know how to use a good editor, and the command in Vim is I just type F plus, F plus, okay, why is it not working? <laughs> What's going on? Oh, um, I'm sorry. I should f minus. So the, it's, the reason it wasn't working because there's no plus. F minus. My cursor jumps right to it. The first time I hit underscore. I tried it one more time. Uh, when I did it earlier, I wasn't thinking about it. Now I'm thinking about it. It's screwing, it's screwing me up. I use the, the editor so much that. I really most of the time do this without thinking. It's like, you know, you guys are probably good enough at typing. You don't really think about where your fingers are going when you're typing. I move my cursor around the screen in that same way. I don't really think about it. It's sort of muscle memory. And then when I stop to think about it, I screw up. Okay, so again, my, my goal is to get my cursor from there to there as fast as possible because that's what I want to change. And so then I'm going to type F minus. So it jumped right there. And then I just type R plus, replace that with a plus. So that's, okay. So, so then the I, I, and so then the, the I, I is, is that. So the the I I is the sum of the plus and the minus. Sorry. So this is this is like remember the three halves, seven halves. You know the things that are recurring on the diagonal, right? That's 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 what this thing is. <coughs> so my with that my T matrix will be assembled. So then I can do B. It's pretty easy. I wrote a function, compute accumulation. I'm going to do that for the II I, I entry. Right. And then I need to do something if I have wells into the Q vector. Okay. Um, by the way, you know, we didn't really do it. Uh, but along the way, as I'm, you know, last time we wrote this function, compute accumulation, we wrote these functions, compute transmissibility. Right? Again, the good practice is, I'm trying to pass along to you, is write small functions. Because while we didn't stop to test these, you know, if I was writing this code for the first time, I would stop. Every time I wrote a function like compute accumulation, I would stop and I would test it. I would test that one function, make sure it's doing what I want it to do. And if the function is small enough, I can just write down on a piece of paper what the answer should be, right? And so I stop and I test these. And then when I call them here, I don't worry about it. And if I get a bug in my code, I know it's not there. It's not there, right? So, I, you know, this is, helps you debug when you do this, when you write small functions like that, because, you know, you can, you can sort of eliminate where the bugs might be one function at a time. Okay. So... Uh, the last thing I'm just going to do is I'm going to say if there are rate well grids is not none. So basically what I'm saying there is if rate well grids is defined. So in the setup at the very beginning, I had some logic in there to read my input deck and s find if there are any constant rate wells. And they are. They're right here, right? So they're wells. The wells could be either of bottom hole pressure or constant rate. If they're constant rate, I need to add them to my Q vector. Okay? So I had some logic at the beginning in the setup that said, read my input deck, find, I think we even wrote, we wrote that actually, because remember we were trying to find the actual grid numbers where the locations x equal 5 and x equal 1495 will fall in an arbitrary grid. And what that returned was, it was a, an array of indices, right, corresponding to the grid numbers where those r constant rate wells fell. 
those indices are stored in a variable rate well grids. And so basically this logic here just says, if this is not empty, do something. Because it could be that there's no, you know, I don't have any constant rate wells. I could have all bottom hole pressure wells. And in that case, this would just say, well, is this defined? If it's not defined, go on. Right? But if it is defined, and it is in this case, then I have to add to the Q vector in the locations where those grids are, I have to add the values. Right. So again, what this is going to do, right, I have the logic up above that's going to go and find 5 and 1495 in the grids. And in our four, block, four grid block example, that's going to be 0 and 3, the first and the last grid. Right? So what this, this line says is in the Q vector, in the 0 and the third location, add the values, and the values are 10,000 and minus 10,000. So that's what this line does. Okay, and so now I just want this function to return, I just want this function to return the data structures, right? So T, I want it to return T, B, and Q. So at this point, I've looped over all the rows, I've got enough logic in there to handle boundary conditions and wells, I've assembled T, I've assembled B, I've assembled Q. So I just want the function to return T, B, and Q so that I can do some computations with it. Now remember, T was this LIL matrix, linked list matrix. And remember last time we looked at the SciPy documentation for that and it said this, this type of data structure is useful for assembling sparse matrices where we, don't, where we know the structure is going to change, but it's not efficient for doing computations. There's a more efficient structure for doing computations, and that's called a column sparse, uh, compressed sparse row matrix, right? And so there's a, there's a function that allows me to convert T from the LIL matrix to a compressed sparse row. So that's what I'm going to do here, and the function is CSR. In MATLAB, it's just sparse. Right? So if you have a dense matrix A, and you want to turn it into a sparse matrix A, you just, the command is sparse. Right? Okay. Uh, by the way, that's, it's smarter than you think, because when you, if you have a dense matrix A, so when I say a dense matrix, this is a matrix that stores all the zeros. Even, even though they, 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 you know, most of the matrix could be zeros, if you're actually storing them, if you initialize the array with zeros in comma n, you're storing all those zeros. When you go to do your linear solve, which in MATLAB you typically use this backslash operator, when you do that linear solve, it's going to try to do a direct solve on it. It's going to try to directly invert, because for dense matrices, direct solves are better. But for sparse matrices that utilize sparse data structures, iterative solves are better. And the back slash operator is smart enough to know which one is, you know, which one to try. So if you have a sparse matrix A that's a stored as a sparse data structure, and you use the backsplash operator, it's going to do an iterative solve, and it's going to solve much faster than if you try to do a direct solve. Do you guys remember like from from 310? Like the difference between iterative and direct solving? No? You don't remember anything from 310. You should have at least went to Croatia and took it right away. You can at least remember Croatia, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But y'all are too old for that. So. Exactly, yeah. So in MATLAB, you'd do something like this. A equals sparse A. And then when you go and you, and you want the solution, backslash B, but again, if you don't do that, it's going to do a direct solve and it's going to be slower. If you do that, it's going to use an iterative solve and it's going to be much faster.
Okay, so so in my Python code, the way I get that C, the, the uh, compressed sparse row format is to do CSR. I'm also going to uh, turn the, the the B B was just a vector. In fact, you know you can see that here. I don't have two indices for B. It's just a vector. It's not along the diagonal. So I, I want to turn that into a sparse matrix where it's all, along the diagonal, a sparse sparsely stored matrix. And so the code to um, to do that, and I'll go to the next line. I'm going to say CSR matrix B. then the last line will just be Q. Right. So my function is going to return a sparse T, a sparse B, and Q. I should say a sparse T matrix, a sparse B matrix, and Q. Right. But when we, you know, so when we did it here, this was a vector. So that's the hardest part of the code. Uh, the next thing we probably all we have time left today is we're going to compute the productivity indices, which you didn't have to do in homework four, but you will have to do in your project. So I'll give you an, an, an implementation of that. And so this actually this compute productivity index takes an argument. The argument is a well type. It's going to be either rate or bottom hole pressure. The default value is rate. I assigned it to that. It, um, and then these are just convenience things. So basically what I'm going to say is if well type is equal to rate, then grids are rate well grids. And else if well type is equal to bottom hole pressure, grids are equal to bottom hole pressure, well grids. So again, there's logic at the beginning, and part of it is what we wrote for the wells, right? That if there are wells in, you know, if we put wells in the input deck, it's going to read, it's going to figure out where the indi grid indices are, and it could be for either a bottom hole pressure or uh, a rate well, depending on the argument to the function when we call it later, then the grids that we're going to run this function on will be assigned from those indices which come from the input deck. Okay. So then, then once we know the grids, the RW is equal to Okay, so this is just reading in from the input deck. I have wells, and they have their, the, the wells, well type comes from the argument, so this could be, this you can think of this like wells, rate, radii. So I go wells, rate, radii, it reads in an array 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So those are the diameter of my two wells. Those are going to get stored in that RW. 
then I have R E Q is equal to D X grids times N P X P minus N P X average. Okay, so D X indexed into grids is going to give me, remember my grids are my indices where I have wells. Dx is going to be my dx value, right, of those guys, times 0 0.2078, right? I just didn't want to round off, so I put in the expression. This is a Piesman correction for a well model. And so then the productivity index will just be factor, which is my conversion factor, uh, times np pi times the permeability for those grids <coughs> times H over the viscosity times formation volume factor times the log of REQ over RW. Probably put, I should probably, I have to put that in parentheses. Okay. Okay. So now we have a productivity index. And so, really, uh, yeah, we should have no problem finishing next time because we really, the hardest part is written. Now we're going to, we have a function that we're going to compute a single time step, right? So it's going to take in the old value of pressure for one time step, spit out the new value of pressure. Right? And again, the idea is small functions. I can test this really easily by hand on a small problem for one time step. I'm not going to write out 200 time steps by hand. Right? But if I can test it for one time step, and I know that function works, there's no reason it's not going to work if I take two time steps or three time steps. Right? So I'm going to have a small function that computes a single time step via the mixed method, explicit or implicit, right? based on the input. And then, then my run command will be the next thing. That's just going to be a for loop where I call compute the time step over and over and over again. So, and then the last part is just to make some plots. So there's no, there'll be no problem finishing up next time. Uh, they, they correspond to, they're, they're going to come in, in in order, right? So my locations were 5 and 1495, and the corresponding values are 10,000 and 0.25 to 5, right? The x value 5. So then I have this logic that finds my rate well grids and finds my grid block 5. So let's say it's in grid block 0. Then when I, say, when I do that dx grids, it's going to give me the dx of grid 0. So it's, it's, it, the logic is there. It's all going to work. So these are vectorized operations. It's going to compute all of them. If I had 500 wells, that one line would compute all of them. A vector, a vector of grid blocks that have wells in them. Right. Yeah. So, so with the way I wrote the code, I could just go on adding wells. You know, I could have a well in every grid block if I want, and it'll work. 